All right, we return to talking about solving difference equations now that we've gotten some uh, kind of notation taken care of. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at solving a difference equation for the special case of the zero input. So it's kind of a degenerate case in that we're making the problem a little bit easy because we're restricting the uh, input to be zero, but we're still going to be able to see what happens for that. And some interesting things do happen and that will uh, kind of help us as we move towards solving the difference equation in general. So for now, we're gonna talk about the zero input response, which is exactly what it sounds like. If the input is zero, how do I solve the difference equation? So let's think about that. If this input f of k is zero, then this nice compact equation I have for writing down the difference equation turns into this equation right here. QE times y of k equals zero, and that is the difference equation that I need to solve when we talk about the zero input response to make it clear that we're really solving this difference equation for kind of this special case we sometimes use this notation y sub zero to indicate it is the zero input response solution the only way that you'll get out a non-zero answer in this case is if the system had some initial conditions to begin with so if the system is at rest and you put nothing in obviously this is easy to figure out just the output continues to be zero However, if your system has some initial state or some things stored in memory and you let that system just continue over time, then that thing that we view as the output is what we call the zero input response, which is really just due to those initial conditions. Let's take that really compact way of writing down the difference equation from the previous chart and expand it. So instead of writing it in terms of E's and the Q of E polynomial, let's go back to what that Q of E polynomial looks like in the time domain. It looks something like this, right? There's all these advanced versions of the output along with these linear weighting coefficients. If you look at this equation, you can see what's going on here. We have all these different um, time shifts of the same signal. So what this equation is saying is that linear combinations of the zero input response and advanced versions of the zero input response have to equal zero for all time. So a linear combination of the signal and time advanced versions of the signal have to equal zero for all time. It turns out that the only way that this can be true is if my original zero input response signal and time shifted versions of it or advanced versions of it have the exact same form. And that's important because there's only one signal that has that property and that is the exponential function. So let's think about that, gamma to the k, where gamma is just some number and k is the time variable. If I take gamma to the k and shift it by some time m, due to the property of exponents, we know what happens. Y of, or gamma of, to the k plus m is just equal to gamma to the m times gamma to the k. That's just properties of exponents, right? When you multiply um, exponents, you add the argument, right? So let's think about that. Gamma to the m is just a number, right? The time variable here is k, so a time advanced version of an exponential looks like the exact same signal, gamma to the k, with a number out in front. And it's the exponential function that's the only function that has this property, namely the property of when I shift it in time, I get back exactly to where I started, gamma to the k, but just with a constant value out front. No other um, function has that property except for the exponential function. So. What that means is that the solution to the difference equation has to be something like gamma to the k. That's the only function that can solve that difference equation. So let's talk through that and try to figure out how we can solve this difference equation for the special case of zero input. So what is this zero input solution? Let's figure out if we can figure out what that can be. Now that we know that the form has to be some type of exponential, some constant, gamma to the k. So let's go ahead and plug this in to our difference equation. So remember that difference equation had all these different signals and advanced versions of the signal. So let's compute some of those. e times y0 of k is just y0 of k plus 1. It's advanced by 1, which means for this specific case that we have here, replace k with k plus 1. So that's why this turned into gamma to the k plus 1. What about e squared of the zero input response? Well, we know that means time shift by two, which here means c times gamma to the k plus two. 
And you can just keep doing that for every single term in the difference equation. And you can write down what all those time advanced versions of our guess has to be. So you can write all those down. And now we can go ahead and plug those into our starting difference equation. So let's go back to this and plug in these values that we just computed. So I'm going to have C gamma to the K plus N plus this constant times C gamma to the K plus N minus one. I'm just plugging in all these terms I've computed and there's N of them. I have to write them all out. And eventually this is all equal to zero. But now I can do some interesting things. So what can I do? So first of all, notice due to the property of the exponents, there's a C gamma to the K on every single one here. There's a C, a C, a C, right? There's C is on every single term. Also due to the property of exponents, I can factor out a gamma to the K on every single one of these terms as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and factor out C gamma to the K to the left side right here, okay? So that's what that is. What's left inside? Well, for this first term, I still have a gamma to the N that has to be there. For this next term, I still have the coefficient a n minus one, and there's still a gamma to the n minus one that I have to write down. So I can just keep doing that for each one of these terms, write down kind of the leftover part that doesn't include this that I factored out. So I can do that for every single term. This last term's pretty easy. I've already have a c and a gamma to the k. The only thing that's left is a zero. So I've done some factoring, and I can um, now look at this if I want to solve this equation, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to solve for you know, the gammas and the, the a's that make this equal to zero for all time. The only time variable is right here, right? That's the only time where k is appearing. This is just a bunch of numbers, right? Gammas and n's and a's, those are all constants. So this is just a number. Any the only way I'm going to have something interesting come out of this is if this term right here is equal to zero. If that's true, zero times this is obviously equal to zero, and then I have a quality. I have zero equals zero no matter what time you give me. So that's really our new condition now. I need this equal to zero. Well, what is this thing right here? It's just a polynomial. And I can figure out when polynomials are equal to zero. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's write down this polynomial. And we need this to equal zero for that equation on the previous chart to hold. Well, this is just an nth order polynomial. And I know how to solve nth order polynomials. Nth order polynomials have n roots. Specifically, look at what this polynomial is. This is just my q polynomial. Remember the q of e polynomial we've been talking about that describes our system? This is the exact same polynomial except instead of a polynomial in E, it's a polynomial in gamma. So I can think of this as Q of gamma, and since it's an nth order polynomial, I know that it's going to have n roots. As written here, I've kind of assumed that it has n distinct roots, right? In general, if I have a polynomial, there are n solutions, and it could be that all n of those answers are distinct. For now, let's just assume that they are all distinct We'll revisit this here in a minute and uh, consider the other cases, but for now, we're going to assume that they're distinct. And it's actually now that the, these roots, these n values that give us solution to the equation we're trying to solve, q of e times this unknown zero input response equals zero. So these are the values I'm looking for that solve this difference equation. So if gamma equals gamma one, I get zero. When gamma equals gamma two, I get zero. All of these values are the solutions that I'm looking for. So I now know how to write down the zero input solution. It's just a linear combination of all of these roots. So I have C1 gamma one to the K for this term and a C2, some unknown constant gamma two to the K for this term, all the way out to Cn gamma N to the K. So this is the form that my zero input response solution has to have under the assumption of distinct roots. This now leads us to a whole bunch of terminology we need to make sure that we define because all these things up here I've been circling and talking about have very precise names. Let's go ahead and talk about them. First of all, Q of gamma. That is what we call the characteristic polynomial of the system. If I give you a difference equation, which is described via the polynomials Q of E and P of E, if you take Q of E and replace all the E's with gamma, we call that the characteristic polynomial of the system. 
Once we set that polynomial equal to zero, now I have an equation, right? This is just an object, it's a polynomial. This is now an equation. We call it the characteristic equation of the system. Solutions of that characteristic equation what we, are what we call the characteristic roots or the characteristic values or the eigenvalues. So there's a lot of different words that all mean the same thing. The characteristic roots of the system are these values that actually solve the characteristic equation. So the particular gammas that solve the characteristic equation are the characteristic roots. Once we take those characteristic roots and raise them to the k, I now have a signal, right? This is now a time domain signal. That's a function of k. We call those the characteristic modes of the system. So we've seen here, if we believe that terminology or accept that terminology, that the zero input response is actually a linear combination of the characteristic modes of the system. So that's a good thing to write down because that's how I remember it in words. The zero input response is a linear combination of the characteristic modes of the system. It's a very important thing to remember. How do I get the modes? I need to get the characteristic polynomial, set it equal to zero, solve for those roots, and then take a linear combination of those roots raised to the k. Don't worry, we're gonna do an example of that here in the subsequent videos. Before we do specific examples though, let's talk about the other cases. In the previous chart, we assumed that all of those roots were distinct. What happens if I have some repeated roots? So what happens if my polynomial actually has some repeated roots? So here I've written that first root, gamma one, to the power r, essentially. That's what we call an rth order repeated root. In that case, I need to make some modifications to my characteristic modes. And what I need to do is I need to raise, still, gamma one to the k, just like I always have, multiple times, in a total of r times, but every time I do a new one, I have to multiply by another power of k. So for instance, if it was a repeated root order um, three, I would have a gamma one to the k, k gamma one to the k, and k squared gamma one to the k. I go all the way up to whatever the r value is minus one. And each new mode has another power of k tacked on as you go. So when you form the zero input response, the form's still gonna look very similar to how it did when they were all distinct, except some of these modes are gonna have some extra k's and k squareds and things out front. So let's go ahead and write down what that would look like. It's gonna look something like this. You're gonna have a term for all the repeated roots, which all has a factor of gamma one to the k, and inside of here are those k's and k squareds, k cubes, etc. like I said. The rest of the terms are exactly how they were before. The root to the k was some constant out front. So that's what happens if you have repeated roots, how you have to kind of modify your guess for the solution. The other case that comes up sometimes is when we have complex roots. What happens if we have complex roots? Well, first of all, they're always going to come in pairs. So if I have some complex roots, I either have two or four or six or eight. I always, they always come in pairs and they're complex conjugates of each other. So think about that. If I have complex conjugate pairs, these pairs are distinct. So if I wanted to, I can go back and just use the distinct results we had in the previous charts because they are indeed distinct. However, sometimes it looks weird to have complex numbers raised to the K. Once you combine the complex conjugate pairs, they kind of cancel each other out, the complex parts do, and you end up with just a real quantity. So we could leave it as is, but it does look a little odd sometimes. So instead of doing that, here's one thing that is sometimes useful to do. So let's just talk about one pair. I have a root gamma and a root gamma conjugate. So if those are my two roots, which are distinct values, one way to parameterize them is this way. I can kind of write them in polar notation. So this complex number has a magnitude and it also has a phase. The conjugate of it has the exact same magnitude, obviously, but at the negative phase. That's what we mean by a conjugate. I need to take the minus j right here. So for this uh, particular example, one way of writing it is just like this. These are distinct and there's nothing wrong with doing this, except you're gonna have complex numbers raised to the K. And if this is real valued, that might look a little strange. So instead of writing it like this, let's parameterize it like this and we'll do a little bit of math and you'll see what happens. So replace gamma with its polar form. I replace gamma with its polar form and also replace gamma star with its polar form as I did 
right here. So C1 and C2, those are just numbers, but due to the symmetry, it turns out that these are also always going to be conjugate pairs as well. Okay, the only way for me to add these things up and end up with a real valued zero input response is if C1 and C2 themselves are conjugates of each other. So what that really means is if C1 is some complex number parameterized like this, then C2 is some complex number that's identical except, again, it's been conjugated. So one way of parameterizing C1 and C2 is with C and theta. That's just a way to parameterize them because they have to be conjugate pairs of each other. So something nice happens now if we use this parameterization. Let's replace C1 in this equation with this representation and also replace C2 right here with this representation. And then something nice happens. I can factor out a C over 2 and I can factor out these common gamma to the k's, right? And look what I'm left with in the middle. After I multiply e to the j theta times e to the j beta k, I get something like that. And after I multiply e to the minus j theta times e to the minus j beta k, I get something like that. And then this thing in parentheses now should look very familiar to you. That is essentially cosine of beta k plus theta. Remember, e to the jx plus e to the minus jx over 2 is cosine of x. So really what I have sitting here is a cosine. So usually what I like to do when dealing with complex roots is instead of just doing it like this, which is totally fine, I like to write it as um, cosine term like this, because this is much more clear that the zero input response is indeed a real valued signal, right? Cosine is real. Magnitude gamma to the k has to be real. C is this real valued number as defined here in this parameterization. So usually that's the way people like to represent a pair of distinct complex conjugate roots as a single damped cosine term. All right, so that was a kind of a long video, a lot of information about the zero input response. We now know that the zero input response has to be a linear combination of the characteristic modes of the system because that's the only form that leads to a non-trivial solution of the difference equation QE y0 of k equals 0. We now know what those characteristic modes look like. They're usually just numbers raised to the k. If I have distinct roots, it's just a linear combination of all the distinct um, roots. If I have repeated roots, I have to modify that solution slightly just like you do in differential equations. And if I have complex roots, it's often nice to group them kind of in these complex conjugate pairs and write the um, modes as a damped cosine like this. So that's a lot of background theory. What we're going to do now in the subsequent videos is actually work specific cases for each one of these um, distinct root or non-distinct root or complex root scenarios. So keep watching the playlist for some specific examples to follow. Thanks for watching.